Uh, my name is Abby Furnish, and I coordinate this monthly seminar series where we highlight interesting advances and topics in stock assessment science, and I want to thank you all for joining today. Today, we're happy to welcome Dr. Chantel Wetzel. Dr. Wetzel joins us from the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Her work focuses on performing assessments across a variety of data limitations and also translating and communicating assessment uncertainty. Today's presentation will discuss uncertainty, including recent literature and analysis on that topic, setting precautionary harvest limits, and applications to West Coast groundfish. Now with that, I will pass it to Chantel. Great. Thank you, Abby, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the work I and my co-worker, Owen Hamel, did um, to try quantification of uncertainty. Um, in the Pacific Fishery Management Council system. And so one of the big parts of my job as a stock assessor is to provide overfishing limits to the SSC, the Scientific and Statistical Committee. Um, and then those go to you know, the, the council, the Pacific Fishery Management Council, and then all that information get turned into ACLs with the goal of preventing overfishing. And so Rick Mathot and some others put out this paper in 2014. Um, and I really liked it because they've got a great diagram of kind of how the system works and lays out really nicely the delineation between the role of the SSC and the council role that on the scientific side, the OFL is provided and then the SSC has the role of determining what the acceptable biological catch that EBC should be by reducing, um, applying a reduction to the OFL to determine an ABC that's accounting for scientific uncertainty. And then that ABC value then goes to the management side where the council can set an annual catch limit, an ACL equal to the ABC, or do additional reductions to account for management uncertainty. And so anyone who's looked at or has done an assessment, um, hopefully gets the takeaway that assessments are inherently uncertain, that we try our best to quantify uncertainty, but at least on the West Coast, we are typically working in a single model framework where you have one best model. And the representation of the uncertainty that I'm showing you on screen is reflecting that within model uncertainty. But we really also want to think about how we can account for that within, but also the among model uncertainty and how that can be incorporated in providing guidance into how to set ABCs. Uh, so there was this really nice paper that came out in 2020 uh, written by Kristen Privachera Johnson and Andre Punt. And they looked at, they did a survey uh, where they surveyed stock assessment scientists uh, around the globe and try to identify methods of commonly used that are commonly used to quantify uncertainty and how that is presented to managers. Quantifying uncertainty can be done using frequentist methods. So that's this top of this figure here, the asymptotic methods around a maximum likelihood estimate, bootstrapping, jackknife, um, and then also likelihood profiles. On the West Coast, we're commonly operating in this upper panel, the frequentist, where we have a single best model. But there's also the approach of quantifying the uncertainty using Bayesian methods such as NCMC, adaptive importance sampling, or SIR. And you know, that's really, you know, as this figure shows, it's really split across the globe of how we are really trying to quantify uncertainty in our assessments. Um, and another figure from the same paper, um, they showed, you know, how is this uncertainty getting conveyed to managers? Are we just providing estimates around the maximum fishing mortality rate, spawning biomass, reference points? And it really looks like 
commonly, you know, we are trying to quantify uncertainty rate across different ways. And one approach that's really most commonly used here on the West Coast, we, we quantify the uncertainty around the spawning biomass and all the other estimated quantities. But then we also distill that down into a single decision table where our decision table has three states in nature. Uh, the center is called the base state in nature, and that's assumed to have the highest probability of representing the true state of the stock. And we assign that a 50% probability. But then we also determine a low state and a high state in nature. And each of those states are given 25% probability to being the true representation of the stock. And so that is a way to try to distill down all these pieces that we're highly uncertain about. And that if we use the base model and take the catch limits coming out of it, this is what could happen to that stock if we are wrong in these certain ways. Um, you know, that is not always entirely effective, but that's really how it's commonly done in our system currently. Uh, back in 2011, um, after you know, the new Magnuson-Stevens Reauthorization Act in 2006, there was an effort of trying to figure out how do we uh, quantify this scientific uncertainty and how should that be estimated? So a bunch of SSC members from the West Coast and council staff came up with this approach of looking at assessments of the same species across time, but then also across species to try to get some measurement of our uncertainty around spawning biomass at the end of the time series. And so here's a figure of, from their paper of how assessments have changed across time for the same species. Um, Pacific whiting, also known as Pacific cake, really can be subject to large fluctuations in stock status, but, and has also been probably assessed the most often off this coast, and that those assessments have really evolved over time. I think, you know, probably 15 years ago, we were still in the, uh, the paradigm where the U, and this is a stock that crosses U.S. to Canada waters. It's really quite shared between us and Canada, that we would, the U.S. scientists would bring an assessment, and then the Canadian scientists would bring it their assessment, and then the scientific review got the pleasure of trying to sort that all out. You know, that process evolved. Now we work together, scientists from each country develop one single assessment. And so I think the fluctuation in that assessment across time probably has reduced just because we've been like, more collaborative about how we're developing the science. But even looking at these other species on the right side, got a number of different rockfish species where for some of them, our understanding of the stock has really evolved across time as we think we have learned more. And so coming all out of this work, looking at the uncertainty within ass assessments that within model estimated uncertainty, but also across assessments and across stocks, um, the outcome of this paper was um, a log normal error around spawning output at the end of the time series for all category one assessments being set equal to 0.36. And so to develop that ABC for category one assessment, this value would be plugged into a calculation for the scientific uncertainty and then the management uncertainty, which would give you your buffer that then would get applied to the OFL to determine what your ABC could be. Um, and really we're focusing primarily today on category one assessments. Those are our most data rich assessments, um, but we also have a number of category two and category three assessments. Um, and so far there has not been any effort to directly quantify how that uncertainty changes across that category of the assessment. And so the default approach 
from this 2011 work was to basically take that category one uncertainty, double it for category two, and then double it once again for category three. So we're applying a bigger reduction uh, in determining the ABC from the OFL as you go down in category because we think we are more scientifically uncertain. And so the work I'm talking about today was being done really um, in parallel with other work done by Kristen Privatera Johnson and Andre Punts at UW that they were looking at, can we provide a better measurement of that scientific uncertainty around the OFL at the end of the time series? So the initial analysis looked at spawning biomass, but they acknowledged that really we should be quantifying the uncertainty in the OFL, but we think spawning biomass uncertainty is a decent proxy and that they should be related and this could be sufficient. And so Preston's work was really to look at, is that true and how does it change if we look at the OFL? Um, and would that give us a, a more robust measurement of the scientific uncertainty around an assessment at the end of the time series. And so their paper, they took different ground fish assessments across time and did stochastic forecasting from previous assessments and compared those to later assessments. And so the figure on the left here is looking at within assessment uncertainty for a single species based on spawning output or the OFL. So top panel, top row is the spawning biomass, bottom is the OFL. Um, and then on the right, they are looking at select stocks and the starting year of projection, the estimates of the uncertainty around the OFL based upon the stochastic projections. And kind of the one takeaway from this, on a species specific level, the uncertainty around the OFL could be highly variable across time or not, depending upon the species. But then when you pulled it into this bottom right panel, uh, you have a relatively consistent measurement across time of the uncertainty. And so the outcome of this work was a new measurement of that scientific uncertainty at the end of an assessment that their estimates of OFL uncertainty for category one assessments was a bit higher than the previous analysis for spawning biomass. Uh, their work showed that that was, should be 0 0.5 or greater if the assessment itself is estimating a larger uncertainty than that. 0 0.50 defaults. Um, and their work did show that the uncertainty around the OFL is a bit greater than what the uncertainty around the spawning biomass. And so this is the base value that's applied to every assessment at category one. You have a starting uncertain scientific uncertainty of 0.5. And similar to the work that was done in 2011, um, the subsequent categories, category two and three, had a same kind of doubling approach where category two has a, a default uncertainty of 0.1 or 1.0, and category three has a default uncertainty of 2.0. And so to step back a little, and to think about how you know, that measurement of uncertainty at the end of the last model period that we may want to encapsulate more uncertainty across time due to right, the specific dynamics of the Pacific Fishery Management Council and our FMP that our fishery management plan has a wide range of different stocks and a lot of them. We, it's predominated by rockfish, but we also have flatfish and roundfish as you know, stable fish, kelp greenling, lingcod, 
Um, and then we have a handful of sharks and rays in our FMP. And so it's really diverse, lots of species. And this is just the species count, particularly for rockfish, that we know that there's different stock areas off our coast. So the number of stocks in our FMP is actually a bit higher than this. And so why that's important is that we work on a two-year management cycle. Yeah, so for example, we just went through the assessment cycle in 2023 this summer. And so we have new assessments and new estimates of quantities coming out of those models. Those will go into place for management in 2025. And so we kind of have this two year cycle that assessments are done every two years and provide two years of information and then repeat. And our reviews, uh, we do a star panel approach and that takes a week long. And typically within each star panel, we try to keep the number of stocks or the number of models more specifically to two per star panel. And so that really provides us a hard cap on how many assessments can even get reviewed each cycle that the maximum star panels that we typically can hold are three to four. So that could be you know, six species or six model areas or on the upper end, eight species or eight different model areas. And so a lot of our work also, we focus on benchmark assessments. And so I think those would be more in line with the, what we're commonly hearing called research assessments and other areas do, but that those probably are really similar. What we call a benchmark and a research assessment are probably uh, the same. We do do a handful of update assessments where that's just taking the adopted model structure, adding new data, and turning that crank. Um, we do do that, but on a less frequent basis, there's maybe one or two that come through each assessment cycle. And then finally, you know, the fa last factor on the bottleneck of species getting assessed in our system is the number, limited number of lead assessment authors. That, you know, we just don't have enough people to go through our whole FMP to provide updated management at a reasonable time frame. And so what that ends up meaning is that in the best case scenario, which is rare, you will have two years between an assessment, but often that period can be much longer and can be greater than 10 years. And so given this, we're trying to think about how do we adequately capture an increased uncertainty uh, given the longer time it's been since you've assessed a species. And so a paper last year came out uh, in 2022 by uh, B et al. Uh, and they looked at how consistent was advice from stock assessments. And they looked at assessments from across the globe and they found that there was little evidence of inner assessment bias, that stock estimates in the terminal year and of assessment were not consistently higher or lower than the same quantities in future years. However, there was a tendency for extreme values from the terminal year to be pulled closer to the mean in future or subsequent assessments. But one thing they did find is that uh, the longer that you wait between doing a new assessment for a species, the higher that coefficient of variation can be between the answers coming out of those subsequent assessments. That the longer you wait, you may get a, a new answer that's fairly different from the old answer, maybe due to um, new uncertainty, but all, you know, uncertainty across that forecast period, but also minor um, differences in that estimated uh, spawning or biomass at the end of the time series. That any like fluctuation at the end of the time series, you know, that may get smoothed out in subsequent assessments, but you're also going to have additional components of uncertainty um, playing into the system across that projection period. 
And so that's really what my work focused on, that coming through the system, uh, Kristen Prevatera Johnson was working on getting that new estimate of the uncertainty around the OFL, so that one single value at the end of the model period. And then I was doing the second complementary piece of looking at how uncertainty changes across the projection period. And can we find a way to capture that uncertainty and use that in setting future ABCs? And so we looked at 17 species in total uh, that had a total of 21 different model areas. And so that is, you know, that's having a single species but with multiple stock areas. Um, that's how that comes to be. And they were all category one assessments. So once again, we're focusing on the most data rich. And we looked at all of those category one ground fish assessments that were done between 2009 and 2017. So we tried to develop a standardized approach to evaluate the within model uncertainty and, and how that changes across the projection period. And so the paper that this work that I'm talking about today comes is from Fisheries Research and was published this year. Uh, like I said, it, we, I was done in tandem with Kristen's work, but uh, I suspect she was much quicker on getting hers published because she had Andre uh, pestering her, where I didn't have that post so much. But yeah. so this work, this is kind of the ideological flow charts. And I'm going to walk through parts of it. So we're starting up here in the top left. So that we have got our different models. And so we have the base model that's been adopted for management. And now we wanted to try to find a low state of nature. So that less optimistic estimate of the population and use that to try to quantify the change across the projection material between the base model and our standardized low state of nature. And so how we did that, we took our base model, we, and then we determined using the default uh, sigma uncertainty value for category one stocks, that was 0.36 at the time, and then use the z value to identify the 75% confidence interval of a standard normal distribution, which would reflect the mid quantile, the 12 and a half percent of the low state of nature, assuming a 25% probability. And so we're just going across all the species, all the models, and figuring out under this low state of nature calculation, what would the spawning biomass needs to be in that model at the end of the time series. And so we figure out what that is, and then we try to back calculate what the R0 would need to be. And we keep all the model structures the same as the base model. So all parameters that are estimated in the base model continue to be estimated in the lowest of the nature. And so we figure out what that R0 is, and then we compare and the uncertainty or the change in the projection between the base model and the low state of nature. And so the equation on the top is just us standardizing that and determining that sigma. And then we determine the rate of change. What is the linear rate of change by year in that uncertainty between the first year and the final projection year, which is 10 years out in the future across all of these models. So once we have that, we calculate the linear rate of change, and then we make comparisons between the low state and the base state um, to get our quantification of uncertainty. And so here's a quick plot of all the species that we did, the 21 different models. Uh, with standardized spawning outputs on the y-axis and model year on the x-axis, where the base model is shown as black and the low state in nature is the red dashed line. Um, 
and across these different projections for different models, there were kind of four different behaviors that we commonly saw. Um, looking here, we've got that same plot, but now zooming in on Aurora rockfish. You know, we often saw the low state of nature, not surprisingly, is going to have a lower spawning biomass compared to the base model. And then once you get to this projection period, this vertical dashed gray line, kind of there's a slow divergence between the base model and the low city nature. Because during this projection period, we are taking the predicted removals, the predicted ABCs from the base model, and then removing them from the low state of nature. So given that that low state of nature is less optimistic view of the population, those removals are probably more than would be recommended from that model. And so you would expect to see this slight divergence across the projection period. In this projection period, we are deter using deterministic recruitment. And so this is probably an underestimate of what we would anticipate on real populations. And so that is one kind of behavior that we observed with prostate models. Another one using uh, this Cavazon South model, where that at the end of the model period, where we go into projections, the population was at or near the biomass target. And so it kind of gets to a place, the base model during that projection period where the catch coming out of that stabilizes and it's consistent across years. And so we kind of see this divergence from the low state of nature from the base model, but then it kind of flattens out and those two don't grow in difference between them across the projection period any further. Uh, another kind of behavior that we commonly observed was a model where the low state of nature had to have a higher initial spawning biomass in order to get to a lower state, that this is petroleum soil, and that petroleum soil actually is probably one of our most flexible models in that there's you know hundreds of parameters being estimated, uh, tons and tons of data, and that stock has been quite depleted um, in the early 2000s and through 2010. And so it has a ton of flexibility, but it's also really limited by it. It's quite depleted. So that low state of nature doesn't have a lot of room to go lower. And so it's got to do some different things in order to make that low state of nature at the end of the time series possible. And then the last kind of behavior we saw, um, Dover Soul is a really good example of this, that's the assessment, the base state of nature has the population uh, well above the biomass targets. And so applying the F proxy during the projection period, you're fishing down the population to that biomass target. So those catches are quite high. And so there's a, a large change of the population being driven down. And then those, uh, those catches having a, a greater impact on the low state of nature. And so here's another way to look that exact same thing, where now we've just standardized the rate of change relative to year one of the base model. And then we calculate how that low state of nature changes in comparison. And so here are the cabs on north or cabs on south models where you had kind of the population stabilizing at or near the biomass target. And so you, that difference in between the low and the high state kind of flattens off. Uh, and we have Doversol here where we've just got that large difference because the population's been being fished down quite aggressively to get to the biomass target. And then we've got a group of rockfish here that really had quite the variable um, differences between the base model and the low state of nature across that projection period. Uh, that our rockfish 
they can be have really quite variable life history on this coast that we've got some where you've got really low natural mortality and they're living to 100 years plus but then we also have you know, what we would call short-lived on our coast um, you know where those species are maybe living to be about 20 years of age and have a slight slightly higher natural mortality and so the rockfish groups captures all of that and so there's really distinct differences by species observed across the projection period depending upon the model where the stock was estimated via and the life history traits and so then condensing that species specific view down into the different species group but then also all together we looked at the median increase in the uncertainty across the projection period, where we were really looking at how it changed, but also what is that final value? And so that is the value that are given up here in this, uh, the top left corner, that not surprisingly, rockfish seem to have the smallest change in the uncertainty with brownfish having a little bit more, and then the two assess flat fish stocks, be it really being driven by that sharp change in dorsal. And so combining them all together, we end up with something you know, that's similar to the rockfish estimate um, that is being pulled up by round fish and flat fish. And so the, the linear rate of change calculated across the production period was a rate of 0 0.075 per year for all of the species combined. So then given the really distinct behavior that we saw in the rockfish group, we thought, can we look at those a little further? Is there a specific life history trait that is really driving the behavior we're seeing in the model. And an obvious one to look at was natural mortality, because that really is determining the, the, the dynamics of the stock. And uh, that did show that species with higher natural mortality were measured to have a higher rate of change during that projection period versus uh, lower natural mortality species. Now, on the low side here, this kind of outlier is canary rockfish where the 2015 model had kind of this uh, stair step down in natural mortality where younger females have a lower natural mortality and then they kick kind of a point and then they just start dying off at a higher rate and so you know while we, we calculated a weighted natural mortality across all the years and that ended up in that lower group, but that, I think that's really what's happening here, that we've kind of got two different states, that once they get old, like things start to really change. And so kind of natural mortality seemed to pop out as perhaps a driver. So we try to look at that across all the species, along with different life history attributes that we thought could really impact how our measurement of that within model uncertainty was changing across the projection period. We looked at variation and recruitment, and this is from the base model years, but keeping in mind uh, the projections were all deterministic. So that's really not playing in too heavily in the projection period, but we wanted to look at that. Slope and maturity, the length at 50% maturity, that the maximum length, length of the species itself, but then also the ratio of the maximum length to the length of 50% maturity, uh, that growth rate, and then productivity, that steepness measurement. And so looking at that across all the species that, you know, these plots generally look like just noise, and they kind of are for most of these um, life history attributes. And even on the, like the best case scenario, we've got natural mortality and that ratio of L max to L 50% had a, you know, an R zero that's still very, very low, but there did show to be perhaps some weak relationship there between um, this 
life history parameter and how much your population could change during that projection period. And so we broke that down a little further um, and pulled out just the rockfish and roundfish. And so on the top row, we're looking at natural mortality and the rate of change from each of those species. And then on the bottom is the ratio of the maximum length to that uh, length at 50% maturity. Where for both uh, of the life history attributes, rockfish seem to have the strongest relationship in these where not surprisingly natural mortality the higher your m is the more your model could change during that projection period and it was also supported uh, via round fish um, and then the that ratio of lengths seemed to be a good predictor for rockfish but kind of just fell apart for the round fish and acknowledging that there's only four different round fish assessments that were used here. And so we thought, you know, because this work really focused on West Coast ground fish. Uh, we did not account for uh, coastal pelagic species. The Pacific Fishery Management Council also manages some of those species. While we didn't use that in our analysis, we thought if we could identify some kind of rate of change based upon a uh, natural mortality parameter that may provide some guidance is if there was a desire to incorporate this work into how they set their um, ABCs as well. And so now stepping back out, uh, so that kind of summarizes the, the the analysis we did to try to quantify and this relatively simple approach of looking at how uncertainty changes across the projection period. But now we've got a new measurement to apply to that scientific uncertainty where uh, we have that base value of 0.5 for category one assessment. But now we also have a linear rate of change of how that should change across the projection period to account for that increased uncertainty. And then that gets combined with the management uncertainty and the selection by the council of a P star to then get a, a, an ACL. And so putting these different pieces together in this table, we've got the rate of change along with the uncertainty. So we're starting at that 0.5 and then increases to a maximum value across that 10 year projection period to 0.8375. And then when you combine that scientific uncertainty with the management risk tolerance via the P star, we have different proportions of the OFL that the ABC can be set to. And in our system, as I mentioned, we work in two year cycles. And so assessments that were done this year in 2023, they get their recommendations get put into management in 2025. So we kind of gray out these first two years, but we account for them. And so the first year, ABC is coming out of this year's assessments that scientific uncertainty is going to be 0 0.5750 and then applied with a buffer or the P star value, you end up with a buffer of 93% of the OFL is the maximum value that you can set your EBC and the ACL at. Um, and then if you incorporate additional management risk, be more precautionary, that value comes down a bit. And so this provides a pathway of potentially accounting for some portion of our increased uncertainty across the projection period. And how that increases really depends upon the category as well. Now, if you have a category two or category three where you're starting with that higher scientific uncertainty, that increase in the uncertainty in the projection period is going to increase across time. And so, you know, this analysis 
it definitely has some clear limitations that it really looked at deterministic recruitment across both states of nature. Accounting for stochasticity there could give you a larger measure. Um, however, that measure probably would be somewhat minimal for a lot of our species in our FMP because uh, the size of the age at 50% maturity is commonly a, a, a greater number, so like five, six, seven years of age. And so you really only start to see those differences in the deterministic and stochastic recruitments at the end of a 10-year projection. So we would probably have to project out further to really quantify that better. And like I said before, this only accounts for some portion of the within model uncertainty. Um, we acknowledge that that is an underrepresentation of the true uncertainty that we're much more uncertain than that one model can quantify. Um, and yeah, and then, so this work allows a pathway of tailoring uncertainty estimates based upon different life history attributes that I think we still should be looking at these in the future as a way of figuring out which species we maybe want to be more precautious in that or better have a higher scientific uncertainty, acknowledging that we are more uncertain if you have large recruitment variations or large or higher natural mortality rates, meaning that population turnover is going to be quicker. But then also thinking about the incoming environmentally driven changes that we know and we're observing changes in productivity, life history, um, just due to different oceanic, oceanographic conditions and thinking about how that's going to change that our current understanding of stocks may very well be very different than what we see in the future. And so that's where I'll stop today. I'll stop here. Um, I forgot to put my email on the presentation slides, but if you have questions, you can reach me at chantelle.wetzel at noaa.gov. Um, and I will stop here and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Chantelle. That was wonderful. Um, audience, we have about 15 minutes to answer your questions, and we would love to hear them. So please put them in the questions chat box, and I will read them to our speaker. And while we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, if you're watching this presentation live, and you may also want to click on the link that I just put in the chat box for NOAA Central Library's YouTube channel, so that you can access the recording and share it with others who could not join us today. So um, I usually take a few hours to upload the video, um, so please send them that link tonight and uh, have them enjoy Chantel's presentation as well. And one last uh, bit of information, uh, feel free to download Chantel's slides under the handouts uh, drop down menu in the control panel before logging out today. So I'm just gonna give this a moment. Ah, we have our first question. This first person asks, were all the compared models made with approximately the same data and statistical methods? Did you have to do any accounting for that? That is a very good question. Um, the, all the models that we used have really very different uh, levels of data quantity and quality, um, but they were done under the same modeling platform that nearly all of our assessments on the West Coast are done using stock synthesis. So we, we had the same framework, but yeah, each of those species probably was much more uncertain or certain given this, the data quantity and quality. And we, we just left it as is. We didn't specifically account for that. In, in the fact that we only use category one assessments, that, that there's a certain bar that your assessment has to reach to be determined to be a category one. And so you're estimating stochastic recruitment, you're estimating um, selectivity parameters, maybe some like history parameters. Uh, and so there's a certain bar there. And I, I think if we extended this to category two, we might see something very different. We may want to account for that.
Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this just one more second, see if we get any more questions. While we're waiting, I just want to remind people that uh, we have a seminar each month at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the National Stock Assessment Science Seminar. And next month, we'll be meeting at um, November 2nd, I believe. It looks like that is our last question, Chantel. Again, right. thank you so much. Oh, actually, I was wrong. I have <laughs> There's one coming in at the last minute. Uh, this question says, thanks for a great presentation. This is certainly a complex topic. What do you think are some essential best practices for communicating uncertainty to members of the public and fishermen? Yeah, that is such a good question and a topic we commonly talk about over and over, either at council meetings or different meetings with uh, different advisory groups. That, you know, one piece that I think always catches some of them off guard is that you know, we'll have that within model estimated uncertainty. And so you've got you know, the base model line, that dark line, but then also that shaded uncertainty area. And sometimes that is really why. And that doesn't mean that that is a worse assessment. It often means we have more data and we're estimating more parameters. So it's a better quantification of our, our true within model uncertainty. And so, you know, you can see a model uh, that looks quite certain and, you know, some might think, oh, that's a really good estimate. You know, that, that is actually a distinct underrepresentation because we've had to fix a lot of the parameters. So that is something that I think, is, you know, we keep trying to drill in that a larger shaded area is not necessarily bad. We're just doing a better job at acknowledging and quantifying our uncertainty. And that's something we, we always want to do that stock assessment is uncertain. And the better we convey that to managers, I think the better decisions they can make. Thank you. Um, this next question asks, would a model with strong retrospective patterns perform in the same manner as the stocks in your study? Oh, that is a great question. And I don't know. Well, so I think that they might perform similar because you're running from that base model and you're setting up the low state nature, like really, you know, forcing it to have a lower biomass, but the same model structure. And so I think you would still have that potential same inherent retrospective bias, but that would still allow you to capture like, how does our uncertainty increase across that projection period. But um, as others have shown, and that you really do want to capture your retrospective bias and make adjustments to your recommendations acknowledging that we do have this pattern. You know, we're not retrospective bias free on the West Coast, but I think it's often less severe than what we've seen in other areas, just because we haven't had those same challenges yet. Excellent, thank you. I really think that might've been our last question. <laughs> uh, I apologize for the false start earlier. Um, thank you again for your presentation today. And Abby, thank you for the, the introductions and for organizing this webinar and bringing Chantal Wetzel to us. Audience, uh, please join us again next month. And until then, enjoy the rest of your days. Take care. <laughs>